Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who your faithless disciple Judas sold for a vile sum of money to the Jews who were persecuting you and conspiring against your life. Root out, I beg you, from my heart, all evil love of any creature. Grant that I may never prefer anything to you. May I always show the most perfect charity towards all men, especially those who trouble me. Pardon me, my holy Redeemer, for having so often preferred vain and perishable things to you, and for having, for the sake of vile pleasures, turned myself from you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who ate the Passover with your disciples at Jerusalem, according to the commandment of the law, giving them an example of humility and holy love by kneeling down on the ground and washing their feet, wiping them with a linen cloth. I pray that this your example may penetrate my soul, destroying thoroughly any haughtiness and pride within me. Give me, O Lord, the deepest humility, that I may, without delay, perform the lowest ministry to all men. Give me perfect obedience, that I may, with complete diligence, observe as your commandments whatever your appointed representatives may decide. Give me the most fervent charity, that I may sincerely love all mankind. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who out of your unspeakable love gave us the sacrament of the Eucharist and in it given yourself to us with wondrous liberality so that you might remain with us even bodily unto the end of the world. Grant me, I beg you, O Lord, an earnest longing and enkindle in my innermost soul an intense hunger for this adorable sacrament. Grant that when I go to the table of life I may receive you with chaste affection, complete humility and perfect purity of heart. May my soul so thirst for you now and so languish in your love that I may one day be found suitable to enjoy the delights of your eternal kingdom to the glory everlasting of your name. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were about to leave the world, commanded and comforted with words of unspeakable sweetness your disciples, and most earnestly, com earnestly commended them in prayer to your Father, most plainly showing how tenderly you loved them and us, who were to believe through their word. Grant that my heart may evermore relish your word, and that I may find your words sweeter than honey to my taste. Oh, that the spirit of that burning exhortation may so glide into my heart that I may be wholly transformed into your love. So direct all my ways, O Lord my God, that your holy will may be done in and by me for ever and ever. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who went out with your disciples across the Kedron brook and came into the garden which you knew would be where you would be taken. May I entirely give up my will and always follow and love yours. May I, for your honour and for the salvation of my brothers and sisters, boldly endure any adversity and be willing even to lay down my life if your divine providence should so ordain it. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, as your passion drew nigh, began to be sorrowful and sad, with a heavy heart, and so that by transferring the weakness of all your members to yourself, you might be able to console and strengthen them when they were in their time of fear at the approach of death, by this your own weakness which you had willingly taken upon you. Preserve me, I beg you, both from the immoderate sorrow and from foolish gladness. Grant that the grief which I have thus far endured may be for your glory and for the remission of my sins. Remove mercifully from me all distrust and unnecessary weakness and confirm and establish my soul whole in you. 
Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who fell prostrate on the ground and prayed to your Holy Father, humbly offering your whole self to him, saying, Your will be done. Give me grace in every necessity and trouble to fly to you in prayer and freely to resign and myself give myself up to your will. May I never unduly endeavour to escape from trouble, but receive all things from your hand with a quiet mind, and may I endure everything in meekness of spirit for your love. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 21. Now, while some were speaking about the temple, and how it was adorned with beautiful stones and offerings, Jesus said, As for the things you are gazing at, the days will come, when not one stone will be left on another. All will be torn down. So they asked him, Teacher, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign that these things are about to take place? He said, Watch out that you are not misled. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and rebellions, do not be afraid. For these things must happen first, for the end will not come at once. Then he said, Nation will rise up in arms against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and plagues in various places. There will be terrifying sights and great signs from heaven. Before all this, they will seize you and persecute you, handing you over to synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will be a time for you to serve as witnesses. Therefore be resolved not to rehearse ahead of time how to make your defence, for I will give you the words along with the wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed, even by parents, brothers, relatives and friends. They will have some of you put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of my name, yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its destruction has come near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Those who are inside the city must depart. Those who are out in the country must not enter into it, because these are the days of vengeance to fulfil all that is written. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing their babies in those days. For there will be great distress on the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword, and be led away as captives among all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and on the earth nations will be in distress, anxious over the roaring of the sea and the surging waves. People will be fainting from fear and from the expectation of what is coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man arriving in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to happen, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption draws near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the other trees. When they spread leaves, you see for yourselves and know that summer is now near. So also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But be on your guard, so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that the day close down upon you suddenly like a trap, for it will overtake all who live on the face of the whole earth. But stay alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that must happen, and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How often have we walked into a church or another grand building and been impressed by the beauty of what we saw? Jesus, in the temple with his disciples, heard them marvelling at what they saw. It was only natural that these simple and unpretentious men were greatly impressed, and so would we have been by one of the great marvels of that era. Jesus, on the other hand, had already seen a vision of it reduced to rubble at the hands of the Romans. 
So rather than joining with them in their wonder, he was contemptuous of the building rather than impressed. He saw through it. He saw through the pomp and wealth, the process and circumstance, to the rotten hypocrisy that lay beneath it all. This was a building that stood on sand, foundations lacking true substance, based on an illusion. We need to remember that Jesus can see through everything. His eyes penetrate everyone's hearts and discover the truth of the people inside. Let us not be like the temple, a triumph of show over substance, but solid and firmly rooted in the foundations of our faith. Shocked, the disciples wanted to know when it would happen. In reply, Jesus gave them a warning, for there would be much idle speculation about when this would be, many false prophecies, and there would be those who would lay claim to be the returning Messiah. Speculation about the when is nothing but idle and is very unhelpful. Jesus told us quite clearly, but as for that day or hour, no one knows it, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. It is enough for us to know that it will come, and with each day that goes by, it grows a day closer. Jesus had been talking of the end times, and of the things that would have to happen before this could be. He continues by warning his disciples that they would each feel the heat of persecution. Because the world proclaimed Christ, they would be brought before the authorities, thrown into prison, scourged, stoned and executed. They would be betrayed by their closest and dearest. Perhaps we have a slight sideways swipe here at Judas. However, they were told not to fear. They were told not to be anxious as to what to say when they were placed on trial. For Christ would make sure they had the words and the wisdom to enable them to run rings around their persecutors and make them appear foolish. If we turn to the Acts of the Apostles, there are innumerable instances of where both Peter and Paul gave wonderful speeches in their defence. The more remarkable in the case of Peter, for he was a mere humble fisherman from Galilee. There was also, of course, the condemning testimony of Stephen, given at his trial, which so enraged the authorities. The world hates Christians. Let's face the truth. There is nothing surprising about this, for the world belongs to the enemy and is controlled by the enemy. The light of Christ exposes him for what he is, and so he despises it. It's inevitable. However, there are interesting words in this passage. First of all, we are told that not a hair on your head will perish. But we've just been told that we might be put to death. How can this be? For a start, it is a common biblical metaphor, suggesting that we will all be counted and accounted for. None of us will slip through the net and not be taken care of. Furthermore, it is quite possible that Jesus was still referring to the events of 70 AD and the destruction of Jerusalem, during which time we are told that not one Christian lost their life because they were given and took the opportunity to escape to the mountains. By remaining faithful, we will gain eternal life. To be blunt, what of it if we lose our life in this world? We have an infinitely better one waiting for us in the perfection of the next. Surely, none of us enjoy being persecuted. But if we do not feel it sometimes, perhaps we had better ask ourselves why. Perhaps we have made ourselves just that little bit too comfortable in this world. The reading contains the essential prophecy that saved the early Christians in Jerusalem. Josephus explained how the Romans came and laid siege to the city, and then for reasons known to themselves, in fact, a small matter of a civil war, they left but returned again a year later to storm the city, destroying it and killing every single person found within. Reminded of the words of Jesus, the leaders of the church told the Christians to run to the hills 
with as much as they could carry. The scale of the events was without precedence in known history, for it was the worst act of genocide for another 1870 years. We do not know how exactly, how many people exactly, pe many people were put to the sword by the Roman soldiers who ran wild and out of control in the streets. But we do have the temple records which show how many animals have been slaughtered in the ritual offerings. For it was the Passover, from which time we can surmise that there were at least one million families butchered in the course of the day, which we could probably multiply by four to give a total of the number of people who lost their lives. It was a sad and disgusting episode, but it was the event Jesus warned his disciples against here. Jerusalem would be taken for one last time and not be rebuilt as God's holy city for God's people until the end times. Of this time Jesus taught that there would be signs all around. Eventually he would be seen, arriving on a cloud in all his glory, for us to raise our heads and acknowledge him as sovereign king of all. However frightening these things might be, there is a message of great comfort for the faithful in the last verse. The faithful will come to attention, for their Redeemer is on hand. It is time to look forward to the glory that is to come, to stand up and put our heads above the parapet and welcome our Lord. As Jesus concluded his discourse on the trials, we were given the parable of the fig tree. Whereas the previous elements of his discourse had been perhaps a little cruel or disturbing for those listening. There is in this parable the beginnings of some warmth and hope. Consider for a moment the length of winter. Where I live it can seem to be very long, and the longest month of all is surely the shortest, February. We are tired of the long cold nights, the wind, the rain and the snow. We yearn for the warmth of the sun on our faces. How wonderful it is then when we go outside and find the first shoots of spring on the trees and the bushes. The buds which we first spotted back in the autumn have now opened. Yes, the month of March might tease us cruelly, but we know that it will soon be April, and after April comes May and the beginning of summer. This is the hope that Jesus was sharing with the disciples. There will be the long cruel winter of persecution. They will be surrounded by violence and death. But they should not be dismayed. He reminded them to look for those first leaves of spring, which hold the promise of the coming summer. It is almost impossible to imagine the warmth of the sun in your cheek. Once again Jesus reminded his followers that the things of which he warned would happen within the lifetime of some of those who were present. Thirty-eight years later, to be precise, Jerusalem and the Jewish nation would pass away, but the words of Christ are eternal. Jesus reminded the disciples of the importance of remaining alert. They were not to become warm dead by the worries and cares of this life, because if they did, there was the danger of seeking comfort in it. But because we know neither the time nor the place of his return, we must absolutely live our lives as though it will be today. In this way, we will not be caught by the trap of which Jesus spoke. How easy it is to be subverted by the world. We find ourselves sucked in through so many different things. However, we need to remember the following principles for our daily lives, so that we can remain firmly anchored in Christ. Firstly, we must refuse to entertain thoughts of worldly profit or gain. It is enough to provide ourselves with sufficient for our daily lives. Maintain a simplicity of life and remember that least is best. Secondly, be sure to maintain close contact with God at all times every day. Never, ne never neglect times for prayer and meditation. 
keep a prayer journal not only so you can see what you have to pray for but also when you have not prayed as you should be sure to spend time in meaningful guided bible study rather than just picking verses at random thirdly we must examine our conscience every day what when why and how have we fallen into sin today confess and then meditate on how these sins can best be avoided in the future are there any recurring themes or problems times of day or circumstances when we become more vulnerable fourthly we must turn our backs on worldly advancement do not allow ourselves to become sucked into worldly situations unnecessarily whilst we have to go out into the world most days we should withdraw again to the security of our home as quickly as possible fifthly be certain of our state of preparedness if christ were to come this afternoon how would he find us let us pray grant we beseech you merciful lord to your faithful people pardon and peace that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind through jesus christ our lord amen